Chapter 2. The Lock-In We have come to a point where spending money is one of the few recognizable signs of success. For instance, spending half an hour in a traffic jam getting from A to B in an expensive car is considered more successful than spending half an hour in a traffic jam getting from A to B in a cheap car. I'm not sure why that is. Even more puzzling, both of these is considered more successful than spending 25 minutes getting from A to B on a train or spending 20 minutes on a bicycle getting from A to B while passing cars in a traffic jam. Similarly, it's considered more successful to sit on a couch in your home if there is an additional unused couch in an additional unused room compared to a house with no unused couches or no unused rooms. In the real estate market, a house with a greater potential for unused rooms generally commands a higher price than a house with fewer but constantly used rooms. Perhaps there is personal fulfillment to be had in cleaning and maintaining a larger home, or perhaps the fulfillment comes from paying someone else to do it. Many men spend as much time on manicured lawns as some women do on manicured nails. I'm not sure I completely understand the point of pouring drinking water on a lush green lawn, not to mention the sidewalks, among the rolling brown hills where we live when lawns are inedible and all the birds in the neighborhood seem to flock to our freely growing flowers which don't need any watering. However, the Homeowners Association refers to naturally occurring vegetation as weeds. They think they know better than the birds. Recently, much attention has been paid to great kitchens and great kitchen appliances, while less attention is paid to great cooking and great cooks, except those on TV. Why boil eggs in a pot when there are 350 varieties of electric egg boilers available? A common misconception is that money is better, or is that more successfully, spent on granite countertops and restaurant-strength food processors and burners than on cooking classes and practice. Who has the time, anyway? This behavior is pervasive. People with more money than time buy $3,000 road racing bicycles with ultralight carbon frames to shave two pounds off the bike, regardless of the fact that they themselves are probably at least 10 pounds overweight and only take a slow ride once a week because they lack the leg power to go faster and the time to go more often. Compare this to the amateur enthusiast with more time than money who rides every day and thus has the power to ride his much less expensive bike much faster. Who enjoys riding more? For recreation, many believe that saving for a year to drop a large sum on a hectic one-week vacation in an exotic locale is more recreational than staying closer to home and taking a month off to relax. A hectic tourist experience is considered very successful. A prerequisite for this kind of consumer success is spending money. This money must either be inherited or earned. If that isn't possible, it will be borrowed. Most are not lucky enough to win the birth lottery and inherit their money, and so they have to earn their money. Since acquiring the things that demonstrate success only requires the short time needed to purchase some item, and practically no time actually using or enjoying said item, that is, unless a five-bedroom, three-bathroom home can be enjoyed remotely from one's cubicle while at work, people can dedicate most of their time to earning money rather than using and enjoying the things the money buys. This results in having little time to develop skills, other than spending money, which can be witnessed by the confused helplessness modern people demonstrate towards solving problems without spending money or arguing on the phone with the service representative. Consumers are used to buying or arguing their way out of problems. For $150, you can buy a propane grill at the supermarket, or you can spend $300 to have a plumber fix a drain. But a person doing these things has learned nothing. Make a habit out of this, and you'll become helpless and deadly afraid of losing your income. As the work-spend method only works as long as there is sufficient income. Hence, so much effort is expended on earning money or finding ways to earn money that people mostly don't fail to work 40, 80, or even more than 100 hours each week, leaving little time to question their lives or otherwise get in trouble. Of course, being overworked comes with its own problems, such as stress, insomnia, and high blood pressure. But typically, these problems can be solved by spending money to eliminate or at least cover up the symptoms. Money that, ironically, has to be earned by additional work. In many ways, modern society seems to be using a slightly more complicated version of a Keynesian economic stimulus scheme, where the economy is stimulated by having some people dig a hole, 
then having others fill it back in the next day. We create problems, spend the next day solving them, and then claim we have made progress. We're even following Keynes's suggestion quite literally when we dig resources out of the ground, fashion them into consumer objects, temporarily store them in our homes, rarely use them, and eventually replace them with a new and bigger model, while sending the old and likely still functional object to a landfill back in the ground. The average American produces a little less than a ton of waste each year. Approximately 12% gets incinerated, like plastic bottles, 33% gets recycled, like metal and garden waste, and 55% ends up in a landfill. Sure, this cycle increases economic growth, which is a measure of how busy people are turning their money over. But is being busy a good measure of wealth? For years, I've been wondering whether there is a small group of cynical people who are pulling our strings and intentionally creating problems so that others may solve them, or whether we're all pulling each other's strings because we're too busy paying attention to day-to-day -day problems like paying bills, going to work, and keeping up with all the shows on TV. Seen from the outside, this behavior makes no sense. However, when seen from the inside, everything makes perfect sense because personal values and personal behavior eventually become aligned with the interest of the status quo. Having a job so that the bills get paid and one can go back home every night and pass out in front of the TV is what the good life is all about, right? Most people would agree, because most people can't imagine any alternatives. They are, in other words, prisoners chained to the floor in Plato's cave. To break away mentally, one needs to be conscious of the fact that one is chained to the floor in Plato's cave. The best way to understand this is to see the cave, that is your current perspective, from a different perspective, namely looking into the cave from the outside. Here is what I see. 2.1. Education and Training Children naturally try to emulate their parents, at least in the early years, and for the most part a child's values are a direct reflection of his parents, either conformingly aligned or diametrically opposed. Traditionally, parents have played a large role in their children's upbringing. Through watching and emulating, children learn life skills such as respect for others, the virtue of doing chores or performing a day's work for a day's pay, balancing a checkbook or keeping track of money, how to judge value, how to get good deals, eat inexpensively, cook a meal and do the dishes, bake bread, clean, declutter, ride a bicycle, tend a garden, hang up a shelf, or fix a plugged drain. However, as people have increased their expenses, households now require two incomes, and thus, as it so often goes in our time, parents have outsourced their children's upbringing, and possibly taking a lesson from their own situation as wage slaves, they now act as managers of their children's lives and careers rather than as role models, signing them up for extracurricular activities that are so very important for their resume to get into their dream college. What happened to spending all day kicking a rock around or catching frogs in the creek? For that matter, what happened to the frogs, whose decline is a leading pollution indicator, and who are becoming threatened by extinction at an alarming rate? Fortunately, most of the skills necessary for success as a consumer and wage slave are taught in the institutions of the public school system. It's not the subjects that are taught so much, as it's the way they're taught. During children's typical 12-year stint in the public school system, the most successful, meaning well-adjusted, learn not to question authority, not to ask questions which don't pertain to the task at hand, to follow procedure, that trying is better than doing, to be a team player, and not stand out. Most importantly, children are trained to sit still for increasingly longer time spans while doing mentally menial busy work. During recess, children learn the importance of being well-liked and fitting in, that is, being unique and special within a certain restricted range. These are the essentials for later success on the job. If it wasn't for this behavioral training, the limited subject matter that is actually taught could be accomplished much more quickly. However, imagine what would happen if 12-year-olds with the same intellectual power as high school students, but without the acquired discipline and dulled creativity to sit still and follow boring work procedures for extended periods, suddenly flooded the job market. Would they even want a job? The mass education in high schools reflects the mass production of the real world. The teaching style has one teacher lecturing 20 to 25 students sitting in rows, much like a supervisor, leading workers, or a manager and his employees. Practically all problems that are presented are closed form problems, where there's only one answer that by construction can be found using the methods in the textbook. 
the subjects taught are selected to be testable, preferably using standardized exams with predefined answers. This means that most subjects are mechanical rather than organic in nature, in the sense that they have a well-defined problem with an easy step-by-step -step method of arriving at a solution, rather than an open-ended problem with nonlinear and complex solutions. There is therefore an advantage to focusing on memorizing the textbook, rather than attaining a broader understanding. This is excellent training for intelligently following procedure, but also a powerful counter-training against using intelligence creatively. The testing structure is fairly simple. Some chapter in the book will have a paragraph which reads, There are three known instances of X, Y, and Z. While the test will have a question, Name the three instances of X, Y, and Z. This is not much different from a job, where there are three kinds of burgers for sale and the cash register has three pictures of burgers for the employee to press the correct one, or three kinds of situations with three different forms to fill out, one for each. This kind of education doesn't instill much permanent information, and it doesn't require much deep understanding of the fundamentals. It doesn't instill knowledge, and it certainly doesn't instill wisdom. In that sense, I guess it's much like the news media. What it mostly does is to test the student's intelligence and short-term memorization skills and their willingness to use these talents to maximize their test scores and grades. It's fortunate that most office jobs don't require much prior knowledge from the job applicant. The procedures for most jobs can be learned by a sufficiently intelligent person with a sufficiently good memory and the conditioning to concentrate on the same task for long hours. Many employers, however, don't hire people without the required proof of achievement and conformity, that is, a degree. Meanwhile, many subjects that could be taught in school are not. It's probably safe to say that adolescent children growing up in a primitive tribe understand the world around them by the time they reach adulthood. They know which plants are safe and which are poisonous. They can hunt and cook, and they know the real nutritional value of various foods. They can clothe themselves. They know how to fix and even build a house. They know about sex and having children. On the other hand, people in our advanced civilization know practically nothing about our world. Despite being wholly dependent on technology for all our needs, few understand how technology provides us with light, heat, food, communication, transportation, and so on. All we know is how to turn on the ignition and press a button so technology magically performs its intended function. Despite their education, students are still left to magical thinking and are thus unable to understand the direct causes in the world around them. Specific functions are thus associated with specific, brand name, products, rather than the operating ingredients and construction of the product it would never occur to them that the majority of their collection of 20 different and highly advertised cleaning products could all be replaced with the vinegar and baking soda which people used to use. It would never occur to them to chop garlic with a knife instead of using one of the many different designs of garlic press. This product-oriented thinking extends to health. The connection between lifestyle and health has been lost. The focus has moved from a healthy lifestyle to affordable health insurance making health a product rather than a state of being. Cardiovascular problems resulting from stress and lack of exercise can be solved by purchasing triple bypass operations and popping specialized aspirins. People have heart attacks because they don't see the connection to their stressful, unhealthy lifestyles, and people die from heart attacks despite being surrounded by bystanders because practically none of them know CPR or basic first aid. Critical thinking has been replaced by opinions derived from pundits and political and religious leaders, since people prefer having other people think for them. World affairs are replaced with celebrity reporting, and satirical news is often more analytical than real news. In conclusion, after growing up, the only thing children know is that problems are solved by buying products, that in order to buy something, one needs a job, and in order to get a job, one needs a college degree which happens to be considered a brand name product as well. 2.1.1 College Degrees A high school diploma used to be sufficient to obtain jobs in most vocations, except a few professions which required advanced studies like engineering, science, medicine, accounting, and law. This isn't the case anymore. Today, the only way to join the rank of salaried professionals is with a college degree despite the fact that 85% of college graduates eventually find jobs in a field different from the one they graduated in. 
This is no surprise, as normal office job functions generally require little knowledge of underwater basket weaving, 19th century Hungarian clog art, or other things of academic interest. A college degree has thus come to serve as an admission ticket to the white-collar job market, as employers deemed that the selective process of getting through a college education is perfect for selecting the most mentally disciplined workers. Salaried white-collar jobs are desirable because they're thought to provide superior and stable pay and fringe benefits. They're also perceived as less strenuous and less dangerous than manual labor. Today, there are notable exceptions to this perception. Lifestyle diseases associated with sedentary stress caused by pushing paper forms around with little autonomy and few tangible results diminish the health advantages compared to the small chance of having your arm ripped off in a centrifuge, say. In addition, a skilled machinist or driver can often make more than a mid-level office worker with equal years of tenure and be able to find work anywhere. A self-employed electrician or plumber should be able to clear six figures and set his own hours. Yet young people seem unaware of this, and thus everybody, even those with no aptitude or desire for intellectual challenges, try very hard to get into college, no matter how it may impair their future earnings and financial independence. While the service sector has slowly grown, and as employers have come to prefer college-educated job applicants, demand for college degrees has gone up. Colleges and universities have responded by lowering academic standards and raising their prices much like other producers of consumer goods and services, respond to rising demand. This has resulted in an overabundance of college-educated people with useless degrees. This creates structural unemployment, which is generally bad for society, bad for the unemployed, but good for employers. Hence, the continued calls for more education, even though it's sometimes hard to see the reason. For instance, it's not unusual to see job advertisements along the lines of must have a bachelor's degree and be able to lift 50 pounds to get a store manager job that would have been held by a high school graduate a generation ago. Perhaps one will need a Ph.D. just to man the cash register at a burger franchise one day. Hey, wait, what? As universities keep lowering their standards and thus decreasingly serve as centers of higher learning, they increasingly function as issuers of credentials, where students have little purpose other than trying to maximize their grade point average once they get in. Hence, admission standards become the dominant factor. Consequently, universities focus on screening methods while students focus on how to get around them. Many resources are spent on an endless war of attacks and counterattacks as students and their parents attempt various strategies, including hiring highly compensated admissions consultants to beat the admission standards. Many parents realize that their children will have an advantage if the children start building their resume a little early such as in preschool. In an effort to build credentials as early as possible, parents push their children into advanced classes, expect high grades, and call the children's teachers if they don't get top grades. Super parents will put in any amount of effort to ensure their children's success. At age three, they'll send the kids to daycare centers that command a heavy price to make the children multilingual and continuously engage them in mentally stimulating activities for eight hours a day. Parents will gladly relocate to another school district to ensure that their children go to the best schools. Parents will manage their science fair projects for them, projects that at the high school level are beginning to look more like undergraduate-level research projects, complete with outside collaborations. They will pay for tutors and test prep materials, the latter of which prioritizes cramming for and passing a test rather than learning the underlying material, and they'll make sure that little Susie and Johnny have the correct solutions for their math problems if they can't figure them out themselves. Rather than being left to figure out their own playtime, children are pushed into highly structured, adult-supervised extracurricular activities, which take up most weeknights, to pad the resume with the awards and honors they need to make their college applications stand out amongst the thousands of others who follow the same strategy. Once inside, the main mission has been successfully accomplished. This is the end of the journey, rather than the beginning. Students just have to pass the time during four years of edutaining lectures on arcane subjects while maintaining their grade point averages like they did in high school, dutifully cramming a few weeks before the examination date only to forget most of what they learned as quickly as they memorized it. If you are sufficiently smart and ambitious to get into a top-ranking university, the value added by the educational institution apparently doesn't matter for your future success. In other words, 
top-tier institutions don't add value to create talent as much as they select or discover it. Thus, if you were smart and ambitious enough to actually get into an expensive top-tier university, you don't actually need to go to a top-tier university to succeed in life. On the other hand, there have been a few examples of the converse holding. If you buy your way into a top-ranked university, you can still succeed, meaning make a lot of money, despite obvious lack of talent. The ambitious and smart people realize that they don't need to be at a top-tier university to succeed, so they drop out and go start their own companies. Those that are merely smart stay, but quickly learn to select a college degree tailored to their desired job or income level and to select the courses with the highest grade-to-effort level in order to maximize what employers are looking for. I knew several people like that. Very boring people. They never knew anything outside of their textbooks, and two weeks after an exam, they had forgotten practically all of what they had crammed for. Today, they're highly successful white-collar workers. The educational system works, just not according to its stated purpose, to educate. As students have come to view education as a product, and parents are still only a phone call away, professors are encouraged, typically meaning their career is on the line if they don't obey and take the opportunity to make education edutaining. Students now think that if they don't learn anything, it's a failure of the teaching process, or the teachers, rather than their own failure to study. After all, they paid for it. It's not what you can do, it's what you can buy, which matters. With student evaluations now determining the career path of young professors, and young professors determining the career opportunities of young students, professors and students have adopted a non-aggression pact. Professors give entertaining and easy courses in exchange for good evaluations. This way, professors get tenure so that they can get back to publishing papers and writing grant proposals to bring in grant money. Such soft money is sometimes a substantial part of their salary, and often the reason they got hired in the first place, and sometimes the only way they get to keep their job. Students get their degrees, and everybody is happy, except those that came to learn and be challenged, and in many cases went deep into debt for the privilege. It's not so much the educational growth of the graduates that matters or the teaching skills of the professors as much as it's the image of the school, the imposing campus buildings, and the habits acquired from several years of following procedures, executing consistently, meeting deadlines, and solving closed-end problems with limited degrees of freedom, statistically quantified into a single grade point average for convenient ranking and quick sorting. In the grand scheme of things, the functional purpose of universities is thus to sort students into future vocations, rather than the commonly believed purpose of broadening their horizons in a useful manner. Ask a college graduate when the last time was that they read a book from one end to the other. The answer may surprise and depress you. Despite this, it's possible for individual students to get a broad background in college. Smart, if not street smart, people about. However, it will come at the cost of a high grade point average, as the student focuses too much on particular interesting subjects or courses which may not economically provide the optimal grade point return on student effort. While college means different things to different people, whether it's a place for higher learning, a two- to four-year binge party, or simply a brand-name admission ticket required by the job market, the increasing demand for education and resulting higher cost mean that many students take on debt. Student loans are often considered an investment in one's future. What most students forget is that the only way they can sell this asset is by working off their debt. Also, except for possibly MBA students, few people do a discounted cash flow analysis to verify that their investment actually has a sufficient internal rate of return. It's perhaps surprising that many trade schools have higher rates of internal returns than college educations. They cost much less, have shorter times to graduation, and due to the overproduction of people with college degrees, the latter no longer bestows as much economic benefit compared to the trades, as it used to. Despite this, many young people keep believing that their best shot at a middle-class lifestyle is a college degree, just as the lower class spends almost 10% of their already limited income on lottery tickets to achieve their financial dreams. Yes, 10%. 2.2. Career. Most career people's lives are dominated by schedules and procedures. They get up at the same time every day. They take the same route to work and sit at the same desk and do the same things day in and day out for many years. 
At the end of the day, they go back along the same route. They have various chores and activities scheduled until they go to bed at the same time. Maybe they occasionally go to a restaurant, the movies, or a sports event. Weekends are like evenings, structured around chores that didn't get done during the week, like laundry, cleaning, and sleeping. Vacations are arranged in the same manner. If not taken between job transitions, vacations are spent a few days here and there as people spend one day traveling and then frantically go around and try to see everything they want to see before they head back, exhausted. The reward for running on this treadmill occurs not through the satisfaction of doing a good job, but from the semi-monthly paycheck. Similarly, much effort goes into spending money. Money is spent as a reward for the drudgery, but also because people perceive that there's nothing better to do with it. Often money is spent in the most inefficient way possible, by using credit cards, then making minimum payments, thus paying for the item twice over in interest alone. Enjoyment is often limited to buying things because there's no time to use them, since the buyer has to get back to work and earn more money. Measured in terms of gross domestic product, GDP growth, this cycle is highly productive, but it could be argued that the net effect is not very productive at all. Thanks to advertising, nobody knows when enough is enough, even though running out of space in the garage should serve as an indication. Material wants are universally believed to be infinite in scope. On top of that, everyone seems to want a cut of your earnings. The harder you work, the greater the cut. The tax authorities want their cut, and the more you work, the more they want. People want money to manage the money you don't spend and money to take care of the things that you don't have time to take care of yourself. This requires more work, and hence even more costs, in terms of daycare, business clothes wear and tear, expensive haircuts, power lunches and snack bars. People run harder and harder, but somehow don't seem to get ahead, continuously bleeding money as luxuries become wants. Wants become habits, and habits become needs. And so they slowly die a financial death by a thousand nibbling ducks. Living to work and spend, it's not surprising that people derive their main identity through their job title and their purchases. What do you do for a living? And what brand names do you buy to express your lifestyle? Despite a doubling of productivity over the past two generations, our culture is still perpetuating the old ritual of eight hours of work, eight hours of sleep, and eight hours of spare time even though this should have been reduced to four hours of work, eight hours of sleep, and twelve hours of spare time by now. Maybe people are just doing what they have been told to by parents, friends, politicians, and others. There is massive stigma associated with occupying one's time with things other than working and buying advertised goods. If you don't believe me, try to give someone that isn't close to you a present that you either bought used or that you made yourself. A tremendous amount of effort goes into career advancement, to earn more money and buy more stuff. Countless books are written and many workshops are given on how to stay late to appear dedicated, how to leave early to appear efficient, where to sit and how to sit, how often and loud to speak at meetings to be noticed by the boss, how to handle performance reviews, and how to worry about other things that are essentially beyond your control anyway and thus cause a lot of stress. Similarly, experts explain which questions are asked in a job interview, which responses to give for the best impression, and how to word a resume so that it'll stand out amongst the hundreds of other resumes that follow exactly the same advice. While such advice appears to be helpful, it only serves to increase the competitive pressure. It's just like Hardin's tragedy of the commons. In turn, employers make a big deal out of finding employees with the right fit people who either learn or are naturally talented at playing the games of the system. The nascent consumer should already have had practice in fitting in and being popular from high school. In fact, high school athletics is a good preparation for today's corporate world due to the importance of team play. Similarly, having no life, and there's nothing wrong with that, but you know what I mean, is a good preparation for life in academia. The Darwinian survival of the fittest often has undertones of survival of the best, a belief that the fittest are happy to reinforce. The distinction should not be forgotten, though. In competitive environments, the selection isn't for the best, but for those that best fit the environment. People are not selected for the best attributes. They're selected for the fittest attributes. A world without trees selects the short-necked giraffe, which is better adapted. Similarly, the career track selects people who are willing to give up their lives for the sake of work. Most promotions are governed, that is, controlled or restrained, 
by the requirement for seniority. This means that a superior has to be promoted, retired, or fired before an inferior can be promoted. Naturally, this predictable trajectory of promotions is subject to demographics. Hence, if you want a good estimate of your career prospects, have a look at the birth rate as a function of time. Also, during periods of economic growth and rapid expansion, promotion is much easier than during periods of contraction or stagnation. If you ever wondered why your boss is incompetent or why it's so hard for you to advance, chances are that he started his career during a period of economic expansion, which required scraping the bottom for all the new positions to be filled, while you didn't, relatively speaking. Salaried wages lead to an employer preference for longer work hours. Also, employers have fixed costs and thus prefer workers to work the capitalized assets as hard as possible. By paying higher wages and limiting the number of jobs on high salaries, employers can make workers compete for these jobs. Advancement doesn't work on the model of a ladder as much as on that of a pyramid. As workers spend more time on the job, it leads to a dependence on the job, since little time can be spent on alternative pursuits. Having several income streams is in fact highly dangerous to worker motivation. This is why capital income is generally cordoned off into special retirement accounts with penalties for withdrawal. This is also why many employers discourage workers from working competing or even non-competing jobs. In addition, debt plays a major role in locking people into working for most of their lives. It used to be that marriage was seen as a lock-in. Unlike a bachelor, a husband would need a job to take care of his dependents. Today, this is no longer the case, and being single is more of a lock-in since the family income isn't diversified by a working spouse. A consumer life is one of intense specialization. Most do a single job without much concern for the greater whole. This is why such great importance is placed on fitting in and being a team player. Conversely, it also means that few participants in society really have or attempt any understanding of larger issues, like climate change, geopolitics, and population issues, or why, despite our advances in technology, we still work as hard as our grandparents did. Such problems are typically left to them. But do they, the experts, really know what they're doing? 2.2.1 Specialization Our educational system and our business leaders all advise us to become a specialist. The reason is that while generalized skills are very beneficial, they don't fit well into the existing system. The existing system requires specialists, cogs, that fit into a system that has already been built. Specialist knowledge is much cheaper to acquire for mass production purposes than is generalized knowledge. Imagine all the skills one would need to acquire to build a car from raw materials that were dug out of the ground. It would take a lifetime to acquire sufficient skills to make a single car, after which one would be too old to make more. If, instead, several people learn just one simple skill and are organized into an assembly line, the reduced time spent on learning allows them to produce much more. Given the limitations of human intelligence and lifespan, specialization is the only way to rapidly produce sophisticated products. In that sense, the complex skills of building a car have been transferred from the master craftsman up to the factory system, which has gotten very complex with computer-controlled assembly lines and inventory management. Conversely, the system tries to divide labor into as narrow specializations as possible to cut costs. Using again the example of manufacturing a car, specialization can be narrowed to the point of replacing people with robots that weld a single piece of metal. 2.2.2 The Cost of Specialization It's obviously more expensive, both in time and money, for person A and person B to gain the required amount of knowledge in both fields X and Y than it is if A were to concentrate on X while B concentrated on Y. In this way, both can gain the same depth of knowledge in half of the fields in half of the time. Alternatively, they can get twice as much knowledge in the same field in the same time. It follows that the more a field is further split up into subfields, the less expensive this knowledge gets. These cost savings can be used to reach even deeper levels of competence. For example, the knowledge of a natural philosopher in the 17th century was so broad that he would cover several fields, such as mathematics, physics, chemistry, and meteorology. Compared to a modern-day scientist, the natural philosopher's knowledge on a specific topic could be said to have been remedial at best. 
On the other hand, a modern scientist knows very little, even when it comes to basic things, outside his own field of specialization. This is solved by having many more scientists, each covering their own narrow subfield. It's important to realize, though, that just because humans are getting more specialized doesn't mean they're getting smarter. Given these limitations, it's clear that the depth of specialization comes at the cost of narrowness of specialization. Having a narrow but deep knowledge means that one doesn't have much broad knowledge or broadly applicable skills. The marketplace compensates for this by making available, at a price, the products produced by other specialists. However, the individual specialist is subject to the risk of being stuck with a useless skill if the demand for their particular skill suddenly vanishes due to outsourcing or stagnating wages due to competition. Specialists that have invested their entire knowledge in skills useful for employment risk suddenly finding themselves without income in a changing world. Hence, a lot of effort goes into continuously acquiring new skills while discarding old ones. Many find it stressful to keep up with the technological drift of their specialization as new methods are continuously introduced, requiring them to discard previously acquired knowledge. Here, a large problem is that previously acquired, specialized knowledge can't be used as a foundation for new specialized knowledge. By definition, only generalized knowledge can serve this purpose. The only thing the specialist knows is how much effort it took to reach the level of the former specialization and that this must now be repeated probably several more times throughout his career. In other words, a specialist has acquired a lot of specialized knowledge at a cheap unit cost in order to be competitive. However, given the low unit cost, this knowledge is not a solid basis for further professional growth. Rather, it's expendable. The means to survival for a specialist is his ability to rapidly learn new subjects, quickly produce saleable works, and then move on. This is called skimming. It's the same strategy pursued by weeds, to use an ecological analogy. At the expert level, a person needs 80 to 100 hours a week to stay competitive. For master's level, it's 60 to 80 hours, and to remain competent requires 40 to 60 hours a week. The professional need to forget and relearn can be hard to accept, especially for dedicated specialists who personally identify with, self-actualize through, and take pride in the knowledge they have spent years acquiring. These are people who consider their work an expression of who they are. They usually produce the best work, the cathedrals of their professions. Conversely, they're also at the highest risk of burning out when the market or their employers force them to tear down their cathedrals and build something else. Those who maintain a professional distance from their knowledge and treat it like school courses and exam passing fare better. These are the people who build the cookie-cutter homes of their professions, which are ideally suited for mass production. These are the professionals. Creating a system based on specialized production thus increases productivity, but at the cost of increased risk to and pressure on the individual. Another feature of specialized work is that it depends on expending resources such as time and energy. Therefore, specialization is not an optimal strategy for those who seek balance in their life. Those who take some time or energy off to pursue other interests will surely be overtaken by another specialist who sleeps less or does not have other responsibilities. The competition is intense. A further problem that causes systematic inefficiencies is that advancement inside the system is subject to the Peter Principle, where people are promoted as long as they're competent in their current specialization. This creates a problem as specializations change, and a person might get promoted to a specialization, typically management, where he isn't competent, his highest level of incompetence, and never will be. In such a system, work is only done by those who are yet to reach a position in which they're incompetent. Although some institutions have made efforts to eliminate the detrimental effects of this principle, it's still observed in many places. 2.2.3 job competition. As mentioned earlier, specialization has another problem. Competition is very difficult because it's hard to compare the actual skills of the specialists. In some cases, the desired skill level for a position is reached by several competitors who are all sufficiently good. If there are plenty of competitors, the decision process breaks down, becomes fuzzy, and starts depending on things that are less connected with the skills in demand. 
In those cases, getting the job begins to depend on intangibles, which are generally outside the control and certainly outside the specialization of the worker. Of course, there are plenty other specialists who will sell advice on what to wear, how to format a resume, which clubs to join, and so on. This is good for the system, but less beneficial for the individual. Large amounts of time are spent picking the few winners of this game. One might argue that the function of a college education isn't so much to provide education as it is to produce college dropouts who are willing to accept lower-paying jobs. In other words, a college education is a sorting mechanism. It does not stop there, though. A so-called career provides a similar sorting mechanism. People frequently talk about climbing the corporate ladder. However, a ladder implies that if one climbs hard enough, one eventually will get to the top. In reality, it's more like a corporate pyramid. Not only does one have to climb hard, one also has to beat the other climbers as the pyramid gets narrower and narrower. While this system tends to promote those with the required skills to best play the game, it causes much stress and wasted effort. Since so many are used to thinking that employment-based income is the only way to get ahead, they spend all their effort on their job to the detriment of their home life despite employers paying lip service to work-life balance. Here, one solution is to moderate one's career ambitions. After all, realizing at an early point that going all the way not only depends on skills, but also requires 100% dedication, reading time, and possibly some ethical compromises. One can aid in the sorting process by consciously seeking positions suitable to one's more moderate aims and avoiding unnecessary competition. Those with less foresight are forced to lower their aims through career burnout. In summary, the work system is designed so that most people have been specialized to as far down the production chain as possible. Specialization makes people replaceable, either directly through advances in technology or through competition between many others with similar skills. Specialists are like cogs in the system, and they tend to have very simple interfaces with it. 2.3. The Pursuit of Stuff status, and happiness. Our culture was founded on the idea that maximizing production equals maximizing happiness. In the past, pursuing this goal was admirable since any increase in production resulted in an increase in well-being. Better food, better medicine, better clothing, better housing, better work, and better living. At some point, the focus changed from better to more. More food, more medicine, more clothing, more bedrooms, more bathrooms, and more work. But can we honestly say this still results in better living and greater well-being? The changing focus from better to more signaled the transition from a producer economy to a consumer economy. Whereas the biggest problem of the producer economy was how to produce and distribute enough goods to survive, a problem that still hasn't been solved on a global scale, The biggest problem of a consumer economy is how to clear the market of overproduced goods. There are two ways to solve this problem, either produce less or increase consumption. Various strategies for working less, such as more vacation time and longer educations, decrease productivity, although they do increase efficiency in terms of productivity per time work. Yet, there are many more strategies for consuming more, government strategies as well as corporate strategies. Government strategies, driven by the political currency of popular votes, comprise inflation-inducing monetary policies, which cause people to spend their money now rather than save it for later, and fiscal policies which promote government projects ranging from military expenditures and wars to job-creating projects such as building bridges to nowhere, to direct stimulus packages for the consumers, formerly known as citizens. Many profit-driven corporate strategies are based on fashion, planned obsolescence, unneeded upgrades, and masterful emotional manipulation called marketing, causing people to continuously replace goods which are still in good working order. Although these strategies seem to fail tactically in an almost predictable fashion, with booms and busts, recessions and depressions, or simply chronic mismanagement, when centrally regulated and directed, the strategies have proven immensely powerful on secular timescales. One result is that humanity has used up half of the oil, an ancient resource generated millions of years ago within a span of a century, while measurably affecting the world's biosphere and climate. Since such resources are finite, these strategies can't be sustained. Economic growth, how quickly resources are converted into consumer goods, 
is considered desirable by the economic profession, while biologists, psychologists, and sociologists are tallying up the losses. However, if individual companies measured growth in the same way, by generating income while ignoring that the income is generated by rapidly burning through their capital assets, shareholders would be protesting. In a world where automation has eliminated pride in workmanship from the products and nobody has time for much else than work, status is based on acquisition and accumulation. The purchase and consumption of products has become a surrogate for creating and doing. Self-worth and status, then, are not about intrinsic values, such as who you are, what you can do, or what you know. They're about extrinsic values, like what you can buy, the car you drive, the number of bedrooms and bathrooms in your home, and the price tags on your clothes. Witness the popular shows about highly stylized homes with a TV in every room, TV being a way of consuming your time rather than your money, expensive furniture, and art prints on the walls. Now go and look again. But pay attention to the number of books on the bookshelves, the tools for the hobby projects, the work in progress spread out on the desk. There are none. What empty lives these people must live. Having substituted consumption for creativity and technical skills, shopping becomes a form of self-actualization. There's no small number of teenage girls who associate personal growth with changing their wardrobe. Retail therapy becomes an active way of feeling good. Shopping then becomes an end in itself rather than a means to an end. Rather than designing for yourself, purchasing professional designs or brand name associated lifestyles becomes the preferred way of expressing who you are, and consumers start connecting with each other based on the things and brands they buy. Such consumption manifests itself in different ways. For some, status driven experiences are sought out, rather than refining experiences like learning to identify bird songs during a walk in the park. New and more exorbitant experiences are sought out, and travel agencies are happy to offer them up. Many such trips resemble harried business trips rather than relaxing vacations. Work hard, play hard. Others attempt to create meaning through collecting, that is, a systematic form of hoarding. Entire industries have been created that appeal to the hoarding instinct, creating things to collect with no use value whatsoever. These things don't even have any intrinsic or collectible value but consumers collect them anyway and work hard to do so. For many, status is associated with expensive items thought to be fitting for someone with a higher salary. Certain jobs are associated with certain levels of spending. This means that the price itself is often considered a complementary good. The item is considered desirable simply because it's expensive. This locks one into a spiral of upgrading. An expensive shirt leads to the purchase of an expensive suit. The car must match the expensive home. An increase in pay allows one to buy goods which previously seemed like a luxury. Another increase leads to another upgrade. Soon these become a normal part of life, and people start identifying with them. When you identify with an object, you're defined by the object, then controlled by it, and ultimately owned by it. If you relate to your possessions, you're owned by your stuff, and it will make many of your decisions for you. This trap is not only mental, but also physical. When moving into a new place, there's a tendency to rapidly fill all the rooms with furniture and TVs. Perhaps there's a taboo against empty rooms? Those extra rooms which are rarely used, the so-called media rooms, the basement bar, the crafts room, are then used for storage space and slowly fill with stuff that people need yet never use. In fact, in many houses, those rooms, like attached garages, serve no purpose other than storing unused stuff and furniture. This, of course, makes it challenging to move into somewhere smaller. In particular, the very idea of moving is rejected because it requires too much effort. So not only are people attached to their stuff, they're also attached to their homes. Continuously accruing stuff soon makes any home too small, regardless of its size. Therefore, much effort has gone into optimizing total square footage, including repurposing the garage and parking the car on the street. People don't seem to realize that the quest to bring more possessions in through the front door is a chronic disease, and that the shortage of space is a symptom rather than an underlying problem. Consequently, modern homes are mostly big, poorly constructed, poorly located, and financially leveraged. Like the big gas guzzlers used to drive back and forth to them, they're very energy intensive, and thus, in light of nascent resource constraints, are also outdated and old-fashioned. 
Ironically, buying things is often used as a deserved reward for hard work. Why don't you go and buy yourself something nice? The idea is that work is drudgery, so in order to ease the pain, the money earned working is spent on some gadget, thus requiring more work. This spiral makes little sense, so either work isn't so bad, or perhaps there is another reason for this behavior. One reason may be that many people are salaried full-time employees. They can't choose to work any less, so they might as well spend the superfluous money they earn. As a result, no matter how much someone earns, expenses tend to match income. This is called lifestyle inflation. Without the wisdom to determine when enough is enough, consumption is taken to its extreme, and people still work as much as ever, if not more, despite doubling their productivity over the past half century. On the home front, the growing use of time-saving technology doesn't result in time saved either. Rather, it results in more being done. For instance, thanks to the washing machine, clothes are now washed more than ever before. And as a result, households spend as much time doing laundry as they did before washers moved into people's homes. It seems to be a tragic comic fact that every time-saving invention is immediately canceled out by an increase in activity or a change of behavior. When the automobile was made affordable to the masses, people moved further away from work and further away from stores. While transportation speed increased, transportation distance increased proportionately, keeping transportation time constant. It did, however, result in the creation of the auto industry and thus created jobs. On the surface, job creation may look positive, but all it has accomplished is to replace a previously simple and non-economic activity such as walking with an entire industry of building cars, highways, and oil rigs to accomplish the same task of getting between places. Cars can go many places, but most trips can just as easily be done in an hour of walking by choosing one's home location wisely. If you wish to go further, there are other means as well. Many other activities which people used to do themselves have also been turned into products. Consequently, people spend time working to buy products rather than learning and doing the activity themselves. The result is a downward spiral of fewer skills, causing greater need for technology, leading to more work and less time to practice the remaining skills, which results in further loss of competence. The more things consumers think they need, the more control they relinquish over their lives and the more their lives are shaped by the products they own. Thanks to the focus on technology, many skills have been forgotten. Eggs can't be boiled without egg boilers, bread can't be toasted without a toaster, and the counter can't be cleaned without dye-colored chemical products. Walking five miles is now considered an ordeal to be avoided. Nobody with a conventional frame of mind would spend one hour walking every day when they could drive. Yet people don't stop to reconsider spending 10 weeks each year working full-time to pay for that car just to avoid the inconvenience of a daily hour of laborious walking and fresh air. This idea of economic growth seems to be a very intricate version of digging holes and filling them up again. It creates economic growth in the traditional sense, but so does breaking a window and replacing it. What is ignored are wasted effort and natural resources, which should be subtracted from the growth calculation to reveal a more accurate number of how well people, not the economy, are doing. 2.4. The Problem with Personal Finance Finance is the process of exchanging cash flows between one period in time and another through the use of financial contracts. The cost of this exchange is the interest paid by the borrower. The longer the time period, the higher the interest. The interest will always be paid in the future, by definition. The only possible cost in the present is a fee. A typical example is the simple interest loan, where the lender lends the borrower a sum, the principal, in exchange for regular payments of interest until a day in the future when the borrower will pay the full principal back to the lender. Another example is the fully amortizing loan where the lender is paid back in constant payments comprising decreasing amounts of interest and increasing amounts of principal over the period of the loan. Typically, a fee is also added to the payments. Financing is a useful business tool. A business is an organization that exists primarily to generate profit for its owners through the sale of goods or services to consumers and the employment of workers. Others would say that businesses exist primarily to keep folks busy, that is, to provide jobs. Using financing, a business can leverage its operations by borrowing money to spend on investments to increase future revenues. 
Future payments of debt and interest are then made using the higher revenue. This shifts the costs of money from a less productive present to a more productive future and allows the business to earn profit faster and earn more profit compared to a business that operates without debt. As profit is desirable, at least to the owners, shifting these cash flows around in time has resulted in the creation of the financial service industry. 2.4.1 Mortgage, Car Loans, and Consumer Debt Unlike businesses, consumers rarely use debt to invest and generate income. Instead, they use debt to purchase consumables like vehicles, houses, furniture, and electronics, which don't generate income. In this case, interest is no longer the cost of doing business, it's now the cost of living beyond one's means. This cost ranges from typical mortgage rates to typical credit card rates multiplied by the outstanding debt. Over the lifetime of a consumer, this adds up to substantial amounts of money. Consider a typical 6% mortgage that runs 30 years. Here, the total interest over the years is approximately 105% on top of the cost of the home. For those who are just starting their repayment, Interest and finance charges comprise almost all of the monthly payment. Home equity is mainly built towards the end of the repayment. It's very hard to become wealthy and financially independent this way, and predominantly making interest payments is more accurately thought of as paying rent, while being responsible for all the expenses associated with home ownership. All debt comes with a contractual obligation of repayment, which is usually structured to last 30 years to minimize individual monthly payments, but definitely not to minimize the total number of payments, which is maximized by increasing the maturity of the loan as much as possible. If the maturity is extended in perpetuity, the interest payments become similar to rent. If the only means of repayment is a job, this means that working must also last at least 30 years. This way, a single decision just after leaving school turns into a lifelong commitment that can be very hard to escape given that the borrowed money has been spent on increasing consumption rather than increasing production. Most major consumption is financed. This means that money spent on major consumption has not been earned by those who spend it. This has a drastic consequence for the way the market sets the price level of anything that can be financed. And today, anything, even a fast food meal at a burger franchise, can be financed through unsecured credit. Specifically, things are priced not according to how much money people have saved, but how large a monthly payment borrowers and lenders think can be made in the future. This is set by the interest rate, which is partially manipulated by the government, and credit ratings, which are partially manipulated by individual consumers, lenders, and credit rating agencies. These facts change the way people think of money. What you have saved becomes less important than what you can potentially borrow. The consequence is that the cost in terms of hours worked is no longer fully appreciated, and people work and spend more, sometimes far more, than they would if they paid cash, counting on being able to pay it back in the future or rolling over the debt, thus being forever locked in. Many even spend so much that they can't pay it back, leading to misallocated resources which could have been spent more fairly by those who earned the money. The systemic consequence of this waste is that prices in a debt-driven society are higher than they would be in a cash-driven society, simply because more money, in the form of credit, is chasing the goods. This leads to bubbles and crashes due to credit being either too cheap or too expensive, and a psychological lag leading to a bipolar economy of alternating optimism and pessimism. It would appear that economists, or the effective majority of individuals who engage in lending and borrowing, haven't yet been able to perfectly model future demand and supply, and thus an economy that is built on predictions of future demand and supply, by the pricing of future payments in the form of the interest rate, is inherently unstable. Ideally, personal finance shifts cash flows around in time so that money is available when it's most wanted and paid back when it's least wanted. However, this shifting comes at a price in terms of fees and interest charges. In particular, many people who don't know any better will simply make the standard choice, which effectively involves contractual obligations to work all of their life in exchange for houses, vehicles, furniture, electronics, and other stuff. To wit, a salary, or even the potential of a future salary, seems to be a gateway to the debt drug. So many people could probably reduce the risk of getting into debt by simply quitting their jobs. 2.4.2 Savings and Investments 
When credit and consumer financing is widely available, the personal savings rate is close to zero. Few really want to save when they can count on credit cards for large purchases or to carry them over in case of a job loss. As such, interest works in reverse. Rather than saving up money and receiving interest along the way before spending it on a purchase, credit is used to make the purchase immediately. Over time, the debt is paid off, along with interest, until the payments are sufficiently low that one can go into debt again. This inverted sawtooth pattern happens on several different timescales, the longest being the mortgage, with shorter timescales for car loans, home equity loans, and lines of credit, with credit card loans being the shortest. Often the latter are rolled over and thus constitute a permanent drain on one's earnings. Naturally, this is an inefficient and costly way to handle one's personal finances. It's risky, too. First, if new loans are the only way to raise cash, because all existing income goes towards bills and cost of living, and new loans are not available because credit has been maxed out, then a sudden need for cash, for example to fix a leaky roof or any other emergency, is a serious problem. It can typically be solved, but only at very high interest rates. Sometimes interest rates are capped by usury laws, thus preventing a legal market solution. Second, paying off the loans typically requires steady monthly payments. If the debtor misses a payment, perhaps due to a temporary job loss or the aforementioned emergency, interest rates may be raised substantially, or the lender may repossess collateral. To prevent this, people will either spend money taking out insurance against such a situation, either with the bank and credit card companies themselves, or with third-party insurance agents. Self-insuring by keeping a number of months of expenses in a savings account, which people with jobs, debt, bills, and other financial obligations call an emergency fund, is becoming an increasingly popular alternative. Other common reasons to save include down payments on a house, car, vacation, education, or health. These expenditures can't be financed because they're unsecured or because the lender requires the down payment as a demonstration of financial responsibility. Naturally, other lenders are often willing to step in to finance the down payment at higher interest rates, thus eliminating the risk control of the primary lender's requirement for a down payment. Retirement for those who are too old to work and take care of themselves can't be financed by credit because of the difficulty in paying back the loan. Traditionally, those who are too old to take care of themselves have relied on having children and instilling a feeling of filial duty. However, those filial feelings are perhaps no longer as strong as they once were, with parents having sent their children off to institutions from a young age and only really interacted with them for a few hours a day, being busy with their careers and lawns. Children thus often prefer to send their parents to institutions of their own during old age, in turn. Therefore, it falls on institutions, in the form of government and private companies, to provide for people during old age. The plans offered by private companies are either defined contribution plans, where the individual takes all the risk, or defined benefit plans, where the institution takes all the risk. In the latter case, the government is betting on the willingness of future taxpayers to pay a sufficient amount of taxes, and the companies are betting on the willingness of future customers to buy their products. These plans are generally meshed with tax legislation, yielding tax benefits at the cost of losing access to the money until the officially sanctioned retirement age. This means that any such plan presumes that everybody will work until they're 60 or 70 years old and that the tax advantage limits are set so that a majority of people will be able to save just about 10 to 20 percent of their earnings without losing the tax advantage. In turn, this means that workers need 30 or more years on the job to gather enough to replace their working income with savings withdrawals. This also means that your typical financial planner will presume that everybody desires to work until they're 60 or 70 years old. Most importantly, it means everybody assumes that working until 60 or 70 is the only way to achieve retirement. With this frame of mind, it's not surprising that retiring at 50 is still considered early, despite the modern possibility of retiring decades earlier. Thanks to a secular, possibly demographically driven, asset boom, it has become increasingly popular for individuals to save for retirement by investing directly in the equity or financial markets, a job that has previously been handled by banks and businessmen, using the savings of the customers. This kind of investing is thought of as a savings account compounding at very high interest rates that are believed to manifest themselves as practically risk-free by waving one's arms and mumbling something about the long run. 
However, dollar cost averaging in the form of regular and typically automated monthly contributions to a retirement account based on financial investments is conceptually not much different from establishing a savings account in a foreign currency, except this one is denominated in company equity. Both suffer from the risk of needing to sell in a down market. Dollar cost averaging naturally provides steady employment for fund managers and most everyone else associated with the stock market. Regular contributions are therefore sold to the public as something that is beneficial. In reality, dollar cost averaging is a double-edged sword. Proponents usually imagine a scenario of an initial market decline that recovers. In this case, even though the starting and ending price are the same, the average cost is lower, thus resulting in an overall investment gain. Now consider the scenario of a rising market that subsequently declines. In this case, the average cost is higher than the start and ending price, and the investor will have lost money. In fact, given that markets rise much more slowly than they drop, a dollar cost averaging investor is more likely to make an entry and invest larger amounts while the market is rising than during its decline. At its best, dollar cost averaging provides no benefit. But regardless, dollar cost averaging is an excellent way of providing steady work for Wall Street, which collects fees and commissions to invest the steady stream of money from workers. The mutual fund industry typically charges around 1% of all assets annually, which over the years adds up to a substantial fraction, regardless of performance. The risk-reward profiles of most but not all fund advisors are skewed. That is, fail conventionally and you're okay. Fail unconventionally and you're fired. Win conventionally and you're okay. Win unconventionally and you're a genius. Therefore, mutual fund advisors that wish to keep their jobs tend to flock together and behave like a herd. This has resulted in the growing popularity of buy and hold index funds, which simply mimic what everybody else is doing, on average, at less cost. Of course, the emerging behavior of such a strategy is eventual chaos, as nobody leads and everybody follows each other. Buy and hold is an investment strategy with no exit strategy. What this typically means is that stocks are usually liquidated when money is needed rather than taking into account when a given stock is overvalued. The aggregate effect of workers investing in this manner is to turn the stock market into an elaborate demographical Ponzi scheme, where the value of investments depends on how many people are retiring and how many people are entering the labor market. In particular, it depends on the level of confidence that the most recent entrant has in the system. And hence, this becomes a policy matter. Diversification doesn't prevent the effects of something as systemic as this. Instead, it reinforces the problem, as everybody behaves the same. If stocks are supplied and demanded according to how many are entering and leaving the workforce, then market price becomes dependent on demographics. The consequence of retirement accounts and the reliance on automatic savings in equity markets is a large class of people who have very little equity ownership compared to their level of consumption. Nobody thinks of using improvements in technology and productivity to allow people to work less and require fewer assets to achieve the same standard of living. Instead, while everybody is richer, at least in terms of stuff, no one is any wealthier. Their wealth is safely out of reach. If it weren't, how many would still show up for work the next day? Individual investment in productivity, other than personal ability to work harder, remains dismally low. Only a few entrepreneurs spend money on increasing their productivity to increase their current cash flow. Others have few asset investments outside of their retirement accounts. 2.5. Retirement Retirement is a relatively new phenomenon. It comes from people having decided that rather than using the time-saving technology and inventions that appeared around the first half of the 20th century to live a life of leisure, they would live a life of shopping and work until they could no longer function as useful, that is, income earning, units in the production chain and had to be set aside. With the institutionalization of society, where work and life and practically any and all activities are separated in space as well as time, People who were institutionalized as children are inclined to institutionalize their aging parents in retirement homes in return. At these retirement homes, retirees spend their time doing the equivalent of after-school activities, with the family dropping in during major holidays, if they can find the time. This is considered normal. 
Those who have accumulated a large amount of savings earlier than everybody else, thanks to uncommonly high savings rates or stock options, sometimes take early retirement. This kind of early retirement resembles a long vacation, which is essentially what it is. The retiree has no immediate plans to be productive, and if he did, he would just go back to his old job, where his earning power presumably would be highest. Instead, money is spent flying to exotic destinations, sporting events, or far-flung friends and relatives. Although golf, fishing, motorboating, and other non-strenuous physical activities have gained some popularity. Although relatively rare, after all, there can only be so many financially independent people in a society, this is the kind of early retirement most people are familiar with and dream about. The kind of retirement that revolves around spending money. 2.6. Breaking Out People stuck in their traditional ways of thinking often believe that the path to freedom and happiness lies in earning a little more money than they currently earn, regardless of how much they earn. However, despite our productivity, and hence our earnings, having doubled compared to two generations ago, I doubt anyone feels freer or happier about their earnings. The real problem is not how much we earn, it's how much we waste, perhaps to demonstrate our supposed wealth when we spend it. As our productivity has gone up, we've increased the size of our homes and filled unused rooms with unused purchases, which just wait to be thrown out or given away. We're surrounded by the inedible landscapes of lawns and asphalt. We've moved far away from work and the market so we can waste time driving there and money on maintaining our multiple cars. In our spare time, we waste time watching TV, waste our bodies eating junk food, then waste money treating the results of those habits. These behaviors make no one better off, except those who sell the enabling products, who, as mentioned earlier, are often ourselves. We have counteracted our increased productivity at work with an equivalently decreased productivity at home, and consequently we're no better off than before, except we work much harder and waste more resources. It should be clear that we don't make trees grow taller or better by planting more of them as long as we keep cutting them down. But this is exactly the philosophy that is driving our current behavior. Anyone with access to rich resources has two choices. Turn those resources into waste or turn them into wealth. That is, they can be consumers or producers. What happened after industrialization took hold was that a few people became wealthy, ruthlessly eliminating waste by focusing on efficiency. Many more people started prodigally wasting the abundance of resources and goods that were suddenly at their disposal. This is now turned into a collaborative, exploitative arrangement, where a few get wealthy selling waste to the many, while the many are employed in arrangements in which they have little control over what they produce. Often their only idea is to work harder and be more productive, or somehow join the few by finding a clever way to cash in on selling wasteful, low-value products and services. As previously remarked, it is impossible to solve a problem with the same kind of thinking that created it. Yet this is exactly what we're trying to do again and again. You don't make a poorly designed engine run better by making it bigger, or smaller for that matter. The reason we do so anyway is that we don't know how to redesign it, or that there are too many vested interests who benefit from not having it redesigned. Recent years have seen many proposals for such designs. Some designs are social, requiring everybody to change. Some designs are individual, but require the rest of society to stay the same, lest they fail. And some designs, like the one in this book, work either way, and thus remain robust while being immediately actionable. In the last case, the social design will emerge from the widespread adaption of the individual design, as likely or unlikely as that may be. The design presented in the rest of the book rests on three pillars. First, reduce waste and increase efficiency. It's possible to live with the same benefits as the rest of society for one quarter of what the average consumer spends. Many of these expenses are eliminated by only owning what is actually used and maintaining what is bought. If widely adopted, the air will be cleaner, products will be built for easy maintenance, and things will last for decades. Many old businesses will shut down, but be replaced by new businesses with a focus on quality and durability. People will have more time for each other. They will know the names of their neighbors. Second, having significantly reduced expenses, 
invest the difference in businesses. If widely adopted, businesses producing obsolete things which are no longer in demand will shut down, but new ones will appear, and it's a lot easier to change investments than it is to change careers. Alternatively, those with greater control over their income can choose to work less at higher efficiencies and save the money for intermittent periods without income. This works well for small business owners or contractors who can decide to only take on the most profitable work and stop working when they no longer need money. It's difficult to run a small-time business and make an average income, but it's easy to make a quarter of an average income through multiple income streams. It's a lot safer, too, compared to the risk of losing a single income stream from a job. This is also useful in case the world as we know it ends and businesses and trade all break down. This has happened once in recorded history, namely the Dark Ages. And being widely skilled is better insurance against such an event than being an expert in pushing buttons on an assembly line or pushing papers or business plans at a desk. Third, find something meaningful to do instead of work. If your work is really meaningful to you, you can keep working. Knowing that you are living a less wasteful existence and that you have the financial security to leave your job at any time. The latter, in particular, seems to make quite a difference in terms of what employees are willing to put up with or which customers business owners are willing to keep around. Initially, working at reducing waste will occupy some time. But once the methods are learned, this won't take longer than the usual method of buying a gadget or hiring a professional. Instead, it's necessary to find something else to occupy your time with. I don't cover this in great detail, having never lacked the imagination to find activities that are meaningful to me. Currently, I spend my retirement volunteering on the board of a small nonprofit, tending our garden, improving my hockey game, crewing in yacht races, learning how to repair mechanical watches and bicycles, blogging, and writing books such as this. These three pillars can all be pursued simultaneously, and they can interact synergistically. Each reinforces the other two but none of them rely on the others. The money saved from reducing waste can be invested, and the method leading to savings can be cast as a meaningful activity. Conversely, meaningful activities can often provide income in a way that reduces waste. In addition, savings allows one to invest in better quality. For example, paying eight times as much for something that lasts ten times longer instead of being stuck with a low-end model that only serves to increase waste and money losses.